Recently, I shared my five-point checklist to know if you're ready to buy a house or not. Let me give you a few of them right now. Am I going to live there for 10 plus years? Have I saved a 20% down payment? Is my total monthly housing expense less than 28% of my gross income? You can stretch that a little in certain cities. And whenever I post guidelines about real estate or I point out that I make more money renting rather than owning, I get a lot of angry pushback. Some of them just say that I'm stupid and I'm terrible. Okay. Some of them say, well, what about retirement? What ha- You want to rent when you retire? How are you going to pay for your housing then? And to me, this demonstrates a total lack of understanding how the numbers actually work. I want you to be equipped knowing the numbers and also knowing money psychology when it comes to buying a house. So this week on my podcast newsletter, I'm going to respond to those common, usually angry messages that I get, you know, saying 20% down, that's for boomers. I'm going to show you my responses and you can decide whether that makes sense for you or not. I send this newsletter out every Saturday. You can get it at iwt.com slash podcast newsletter, and it will be coming out this Saturday where I respond to common questions about buying versus renting. Again, it's free at iwt.com slash podcast newsletter. We put the offer down in the house and Lula woke up the next day. And actually for the two weeks before closing, I almost every night I had like panic attacks. So just... Whoa. Um, yeah, like crazy level of anxiety. I think the the psychological like burden of, of debt for me, I I know I felt it like in my body, like in a very, very real way. We weren't at the healthiest place. On the other hand, like he had to make a decision, financial decision. So a lot of the conversation we had was, I'm doing this for you, but do you want it? What was your monthly payment on the place you were renting right before this? We're paying about eighteen hundred um, per month for rent. So, and now what are you paying? We're paying forty one fifty. When I put my head down my pillow at night, it's like, okay, so even if all the numbers work fine, it just seems like there's this huge kind of liability of the house hanging over my head. I kind of have like this big picture of like, oh, it's fine, like we'll be fine, and the stress is on him because he does everything for planning and finance and all of that stuff, and I don't. So I live with peace and he was his sleep. Meet Jonathan and Shalom. Jonathan is 31, Shalom is 27, and they've been married for five years. He works in tech as a program manager, and she is a nurse having recently finished her second degree. What we're going to talk about today is how they have started to disagree about money when it comes to their house. They recently bought a house, and I want you to hear the way they talk about money and about things like getting a couch, because so many of us will have the exact same conversations at some point in our lives. As always, remember that you can watch this full episode on YouTube, which is quite entertaining to see the facial expressions and body language. All right, let's get to it. Why'd you guys buy this house, by the way? (laughs) Oh, that's a... I can't wait for this. I'll let you speak. They're just laughing. You'll let me talk? Yes. What made us make the leap? Yeah. Yeah, so I think... uh, Wow, there's a lot of smiles going on right now. (laughs) Like, what in the hell is happening? Everybody's, like, looking down. I I was originally super against buying a house. That kind of, I agreed, let's at least see what's out there. Kind of open-minded. We were, when we first started looking for a house, we did it as a date thing. Okay. Like like Sunday girl. date, let's just go see what's around. Saturdays, you know, like why don't we do open house and see what's like on the market and how much it is and what the process is because I don't know how buying a house, my parents don't don't own a, a place or a house a property in the US. So, um we started attending like open houses and that it just went really fast and we saw this place and then we had to buy it a week after. The two of you were like, "Oh, like Let's go on date night today. What do you want to do? I want to go to ice cream. I want to go to an open house. And then you blink your eyes and you tripped and you fell and you you like handed over like $500,000 or something. Like this is the most expensive fucking date night in history. I think when we had the conversation, um, and this is like housing is so expensive in Seattle. And this was like on the lower house market. And if we ever buy a, a place and 
this might be like the lowest price we would get for the place where like the for the area we're in. And that was the rational I had. If we end up having kids that we're going to need a, a place that's bigger than like just an apartment for a freedom too. like we both grew up before I came to the US or Jonathan also grew up was a big backyard. And like we had a very good memory just playing outside and running around. For me, I want to be able to do that for the kids we're going to have. And I don't want to like raise kids in a very like apartment, very tight area. And that's with that emotion though, like I think we rushed into, hey, like we need to get the house and whatever the house, like whatever we can with the budget or with the price that, you know, we can buy it now. And then things things go very, very fast. Like you start looking at houses and then you kind of get into negotiations and then things go like very, very fast. The house we were looking at, someone else had an offer down. So I think it kind of got like, how can we, you know, win the house? And then the, the issue is once you put your money down, uh, put big earnest payments, then... What was your first bid for the house? Um, so our first bid was about, you're originally going for like 700. Uh-huh. Um, so... And what'd you end up getting it at? Uh, so we, it didn't, we had to counter with the full, the full price. Full so. was what? 7.30. I don't think realize just financially um, and emotionally just everything that goes into buying the What house. do you mean? It's just, uh, you know, you look at the internet and everybody says you buy a house and then it prints money. And then if you don't like it, you just rent it out. And that's how you create generational wealth. What are you telling me? They're not telling you the full story, Jonathan? <laughs> no. And, you know, I did. Uh, I did run the numbers as it were. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would just say that there's things that you know, you'll look at a spreadsheet and it works out. The numbers may work, but uh, just kind of the psychological element of being in that much debt and then um, how there's like fixed costs are not the same thing as, uh, you know, your your other money. Just it's required for you every single every single month. All of this is hilarious. And I really like Jonathan and Shalom. So we're all having fun. One thing I do want to point out is that offhand comment she made about if we have kids, we're going to need a bigger place. And we grew up with a lawn and it has so many good memories. It is no accident that when people go through life changes in America, they all say the same thing. I'd rather have a small wedding and put a down payment on a house. Or we're having kids, so we need a bigger car and a house with a yard. Do you find that interesting? Do you think that every one of us just independently came up with the exact same phrases? Do you think that other people in other countries say the same things? Or do you think there might be a series of organizations who stand to profit from you believing you need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars at a very specific time in your life? Just remember, these peculiar beliefs about money pop up in very specific circumstances over and over again. If you decide you want a house with a lawn or a certain type of car, fantastic. If you can afford it, you run the numbers and it's joyful to you, great. But do not simply slide into someone else's idea of a rich life. What was your monthly payment on the place you were renting right before this? Yeah, that was part of the thing that was really stressful. So we were paying we're paying about eighteen hundred um, per month for rent. So eighteen hundred, but and now what are you paying? We're paying forty one fifty, uh, which um, I didn't put on the plan, but. Next year, it's going to be going up 500, and then the year after that, it's going up 500. No, no, that, that can't be because everybody tells me that real estate allows you to lock in your price and you never pay more. That's what the internet told me. Uh, and by the way, your utilities cost 400 bucks a month, right? Let's not forget that. Mm-hmm. That's kind of a considerable jump, right? You went from 1800 a month in rent, which was all in. That's how much you paid. That was it. To now 4500 plus assorted phantom costs that haven't even really been added. Let's just say, I don't know, four or 500 bucks extra a month ballpark. That's a huge jump. Mm-hmm. More than double. When I put my head down my pillow at night, it's like, okay, so even if all the numbers work fine, this seems like there's this huge kind of liability of the house hanging over my head. You know, there's, it's, it's just like those things like, you know, flood, there's mold. I mean, there could be a tornado hits the house. I mean, and it's kind of one of those things where, um, yeah, I just, I feel that, feel that weight. Shalom, what happens when your head hits the pillow? I fall asleep. 
Oh. No. <laughs> it's so interesting. I kind of have like this big picture of like, oh, it's fine. Like we'll be fine. And the stress is on him because he does everything for planning and finance and all of that stuff. And I don't. So I live with peace and he loses his sleep. It's so interesting. I wonder if there are any patterns here. Um, the person who just kind of lapsed into taking care of the money is the one who's consumed with worrying about it. And the one who, you know, goes to work and, and says like, oh, I trust him. She's fallen asleep within two seconds. Any patterns here, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll see the pattern? I just see it. Yeah, I can see the pattern. I think mainly in a probably a fear uh, side of things. So we put we put the offer down in the house and Lily woke up the next day. And uh, actually for the two weeks before closing, I I almost every night I had like panic attacks. So just... Whoa. Um, yeah, like crazy level of anxiety. I think um, it started to kind of the the psychological like burden of of debt for me. Um, I I don't know I felt it like in my body, like in a very very real way. We weren't at the healthiest place, both of us. Um, me, I got attached to the house because we toured so many houses, uh -huh. and this felt like it was the house. Mm. And for Jonathan. One hand, when he says no, he felt like he was not doing the right thing for me. On the other hand, like he had to make a decision, financial decision. So a lot of the conversation we had was, I'm doing this for you, but do you want it? This is the most American story I've ever heard in my life. Two people are just going out for coffee, having a nice walk. They stumble into a Saturday open house and then they go, you know what? We should do this every Saturday. They do it for months. They get so tired. In their ears, meanwhile, people are chirping, saying, you need to buy a house. You're just throwing money away on rent. Meanwhile, they're looking at prices going, how are we ever going to afford something like this? Then one of them starts going, well, what about kids? Well, we don't have kids yet. Well, one day we're going to have kids and then we need to have a yard and a lawn for them. Then the other one starts having panic attacks. Then they start arguing, what about me? What about you? And finally they go, screw it. Let's just write a check. I'm done with this. And then seven months later, they end up looking back and going, uh, we're paying more than double what we paid in rent. <laughs> Okay, look, buying might end up being a good decision for them, but the way they made this decision is fascinating to me. It is exactly what the real estate industry wants people to do. I had to live by myself after, so we got married right after graduation. So okay. I never had to experience, even after getting a job, what it means to plan or like actually like budget. A mm -hmm. lot of it has been done by Jonathan. Um, even if our income, like and our income is combined, but a lot of it is done by him, how we budget our life and what we do. Kind of early on in our relationship, I was kind of the one who just had a little bit more fluency around money, mm -hmm. uh, a little more background around money. I probably in the beginning of the relationship, uh, just kind of, I handled things. I wouldn't say I was overly controlling, but just that's kind of the default roles we fell into. So what is an example of something that you previously were totally aligned on financially speaking? Traveling, we do, do a go? lot of travel. We've been to a lot of different places, Italy, Mexico, um, Ethiopia. Um, Sweden. Yeah, we travel quite a bit. So okay. in those areas, we tend to agree on how much we spent and the amount of money we allocate to our, those things. What would be perhaps the most expensive trip that you have taken together? Europe, Italy. And England. So how did you decide how much to spend? Was that decided ahead of time or was it after the fact? Talk to me about that. I'd say we we kind of went in with a budget. Um, I think we did end up exceeding it um, a little bit, but yeah, we were, we were pretty careful in how we, how we went forward with spending and so forth. Who came up with the budget? Jonathan that was, did. That, that was me. So I'm going to guess that's a trend, right? Yes, uh, and it's a yeah. reflection I'm actually like thinking about right now. We do travel a lot together, but a lot of the budgeting is put by Jonathan. And I don't even have to worry about like how much we're planning because he does a lot of the planning and I kind of like trust his planning mm -hmm. and um, I trust whatever happens afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you. You said, I don't have to worry. I noticed you used that word worry. Is thinking about money the same as worrying about it? Yeah, sometimes since we moved in, there's a couple of things that needs to get that needed to get done, like painting the house and like fixing floors and that kind of stuff. 
And now for me, it's like, let me furnish the house. But Jonathan has been kind of like putting a pause on those things and saying like, we don't have the budget for that now. And we can't do those things. And in my head, the house is empty. So we need to go and like, actually like make it feel like a home. Is it empty? Like literally empty? <laughs> not literally, but there are things that are, that should be there that are not. They're can not I, there. Can I see? The living room? Okay. All right, let's get a look here. House tour. So this is how new is this house? Um, uh, we moved in completely like last week. Oh wow! Okay, pretty yeah. new. All right, and you just bought it. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So it's a little messy, but this is what okay. it looks like right now. All right, hold hold it, hold it right there. Don't move. So okay. we're looking at what is this? Your family room? Yes. Beautiful living room. And show us what else are we? So you think that's missing like a couch? Yeah. So like. Having a couch would be better to have a couch, but we have another couch that's by the entrance, which is okay. right there. So uh, there's all the paper on the floor. So excuse me for that. Don't worry. Um, Jonathan wants that couch to move on that side and we don't need another couch. Ah, and is that a source of disagreement with the two of you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure there's more, but I think we get the idea. Yes. <laughs> That's cool. I like that we just got the home tour. Thank you. This might be the first. Are we the first people to have ever seen your house? Yeah. Actually, I think so. Yeah. We haven't had people over yet. So we're probably doing a housewarming party in a week or so. Love so it. All right. Maybe I'll send you an invite. All right, please. Me and just a few million other people who are going to see this. This is great. <laughs> All right. So you move in about a week ago and you've been talking about getting new stuff furnishing it i say we should probably get a couch for the living room and jonathan responds you can go ahead and respond yeah I, I usually um i usually kind of couch it in terms of like um you know trying to create a budget for it and then planning for it and distributing that amount we put every month to getting it so um usually i kind of defer it i don't get upset right away but I try to have like a rational getting like I try to get rational out of him. So yes, budgeting makes sense, but at the same time, we just moved to a new house. And like after we do the basics, then we can save. Like getting a couch and then we can put money if we need to do anything else on the, on the house. So how long do you want to go before you get a couch, Jonathan? It's a good question. Probably probably a good year. So um I guess I, I tend to have pretty simple requirements. So that noise was Shalom bursting into laughter. Yes. Why are you laughing? I'm laughing because it's funny to me. Like, how can you live without a couch for a year? This is actually pretty interesting. It's funny, but I can also see both sides. Jonathan says we should save for a couch, then buy it. Shalom is like, um, how long can you live without a couch? A year? Remember this detail. Well, this is going to happen pretty soon, right? You're having this get together next exactly. week. Exactly. Oh, wow. The stakes are high. Wait, so what's going to happen right now? If you had people come over tonight, what would they do? Will you please answer that, Jonathan? I mean, we do have a nice backyard. So it'd probably be kind of like a long party kind of, kind of thing. Standing? Um, could be standing. Yeah. Or picnic blankets, maybe. So I can't wait to see that. What does a house mean to you? We live in a community. This space provides that like home for those people too. Like family comes, stays with us. Friends like traveling, they stay with us. Mm. And having that space for me is huge versus like, oh, it's just the two of us. And um, yeah, basically like a little shelter. All right. What does a uh, house mean to you, Jonathan? Yeah, I'd say... Um... A house, uh, to clarify, do you mean like just renting a house, owning a house, or just a house in general? Your house. My house. Yeah, I would say that the house is not really a good investment. But I, I think for me also, there is an element of which when I'm kind of done living in a house, uh, you know, I don't, I don't end up in a worse financial situation, even if I'm not getting great returns on it. When it comes to house, he does not care. It's not like literally we can live in... We lived in a 500 square feet apartment and that was his idle space to live in. So he doesn't care, but you care. I care about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, when it comes to the house, there's kind of all these different things around like remodeling the house. So furniture is kind of the first thing, but uh, we've talked about we had contractors coming in to estimates. 
Sean really wanted to get the the kitchen done, and it turned out it was going to be about sixty thousand. I think was what we were looking at. For me, that was just like complete shock. I just I uh, I reacted kind of very strongly and said, "There's no way, you know, we just put down a huge amount for a house. There's no way we can, you know, we can go ahead and throw more money into the house." I, I'm not sure I'd ever want to spend sixty k on the house. I think is kind of um, where I'm at. It feels like I'm putting all of my you know extra cash in something that for me. Um, you know, isn't, I would say as much part of my rich life. It's more of those things like experiences and so forth. And kind of one of those things that really triggered it for me, um, or kind of brought on, uh, brought on everything was we just celebrated our fifth year anniversary and we spent, you know, about a thousand dollars kind of celebrating and it was a really fun time. Um, but then I remember, um, about a, you know, five years ago when we got married, it was about 15 grand for a wedding. You know, it was pretty, pretty decent. But first day we owned the house, we ended up remodeling the floors and we paid the same amount. And so kind of in my mind... You paid 15K for the floors? Yeah, 15K for the floors. And so for me, kind of, you know, I pay attention to numbers quite a bit, but the amount of, you know, joy and happiness that we had kind of our wedding and how much money we spent, how much we're able to create really a wonderful environment, really wonderful experience... And then the satisfaction kind of I got from wood floors, which don't get me wrong, they're great wood floors, but just kind of that that for me helped kind of clarify, I think, where I see myself wanting to spend money. Sounds like you got m- much more enjoyment from 15000 spent on your wedding than 15000 spent on floors. Is that right? That's correct. All right. Shalom, what did you enjoy more, your wedding or the floors? Uh, I think... Uh... Oh my gosh, this is so hard. The floor. I would I think I would choose the floor because we're gonna have it for the next 30 years. All right. Wait, I don't even know what to say right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I loved my wedding. And it, it is a wedding and I cherished it. But like the floor, it will last forever. You know, not forever, obviously. We're not gonna live here forever. But uh, it sounded really stupid. Okay, I was 100% sure she was going to say, I love my wedding more than the floor that I walk on with my dirty feet. And Shalom looked me straight in the eye and said, I love this goddamn flooring. I am speechless. This is why I love my job. Where we live, it's actually, uh, it's more expensive uh, mortgage than uh, to rent. So we we couldn't make the money. Uh, it's, I think it's about 3500 to rent a similar house. So we're already paying kind of uh, more than it would cost to rent. Can I just articulate that so everybody understands it? So you're telling me to rent a similar square footage, similar bedroom, bathroom in your neighborhood, it's 3,500. Correct. Everybody listen up and listen closely. It's 3,500 to rent a similar place and you guys are paying how much per month? All in? All in. How much would you say? It would be close to five. This year, it's probably going to be like five. Yeah. Maybe five and a half. Yeah, exactly. 5,500 conservatively. Yes. So just so everybody understands, people go, it's always cheaper to buy. No, it's not. So you, you'd you kind of modeled it out. In your model, Jonathan, had you calculated that it would cost like 5,500 a month? No, I think I... The issue is I use kind of these like ballpark numbers, but I didn't actually like get the real numbers. And so for me, I think I didn't quite internalize it. Like I, I looked up online, you know, how much you generally spend on things, but because I was kind of using just general, yeah. general numbers, I didn't really personalize it. I think you're picking like 1% per year for maintenance, yep. that kind of thing, which is, <laughs> which kind of explains why this couch has become a central focus. Shalom, do you mm-hmm. see that? Yes. Yes, it's I not do. just the couch, right? It's like that that old movie about washing dishes. And who is it? Rosie Perez. She's like, I don't want you to wash the dishes. I want you to want to wash the dishes. I think the house has to do with like the quality of life we're living too, mm-hmm. right? We spend so much time in the house. Mm-hmm. Um, whatever we buy for the house or we put into the house, we spend in it more than we spent time traveling. Yeah. So it's not just the house. It's also our like dwelling space. Would you be willing to spend more on the house if it meant you traveled less? I think house would come first for me. Have you ever made these kind of trade-offs before with money? No. Okay, so if that's the case and your income is sort of 
combined and he quote worries about money and it seems to work for you, then just out of curiosity, why not just let him handle the money for the house? Why is it different for the house? That is what's making this a little hard for us too. We both love to travel. We both try to love to try new things and stuff. I am more into like doing interior stuff and house stuff and Jonathan dislike or hate that actually. So I think that's why we're having a lot of disagreement. There's like, we don't have the same value when it comes to home and house, but the rest of our values align when it comes to actually like doing stuff together or spending money toward other things. Jonathan, where'd you grow up? Uh, I grew up on Bainbridge Island. So it's like an island in the Pacific Northwest. What would you describe uh, your socioeconomic status growing up? Probably like upper middle class. Upper middle class. All right. Mm -hmm. What do you remember your parents? Uh, was, was it two parents, one parent? Yeah, uh, it was two parents. Um, you know, my dad, kind of in our family, he's the one who kind of handles the spreadsheets. He's got spreadsheet just larger than I can possibly imagine. It horizontal scrolls and vertical scrolls, hundred columns. It's he's got serious records um, of every penny that goes out of the house, and it's kind of you know my mom, you know, she trusts my dad, and uh, you know. He, he tends to do a pretty good job at it. So that's kind of kind of the rules. So I think that's definitely influenced me. When did they talk to you about investing? What age? So investing, uh, I've actually probably got to give uh, you credit for that. I think even before it comes to investing, aside from saving, um, I actually uh, came across that idea in your book in sophomore year in college. Okay, so you found that on your own. Yep. You don't recall your parents talking about that? Uh, no, I mean, I went to my parents afterwards and asked my dad a lot of questions and he helped a lot, uh, cool. just kind of filling in information, but yeah. Uh, did your parents pay for college for you? Uh, no, they helped, but I, I, I paid. Cool. How'd you do that? So, I, uh, you know, I went into a fair bit of debt in college, uh, and, uh, in sophomore year, uh, I read your book, uh, and then kind of after graduating, um, I, I lived what is in essentially a closet for, you know, probably a few years. What was um, your rent? What was my rent? I paid $600 out of college. So, okay. What do you do? So I'm a, I'm a program manager in tech. Cool. All right. So your parents were upper middle class. They did talk to you about finances, but not to the level of investing. And you went to school, you sort of sought out your own education, found my book, et cetera. Uh, lived frugally, and then eventually, I'm guessing, increased your income and paid off a bunch of debt, right? Correct. All right. Shalom, tell me about what you remember about money as a kid. Where did you grow up, by the way? Um, I moved to the US when I was 14. So before that, I was in Ethiopia. Two parents and two younger siblings. Got it. Uh, are your parents still abroad? Uh, no, they're in the US. In they, the US. they live here in Washington. Let's start back to when you were in Ethiopia. What do you remember about money back then? Culturally, from what I remember, like people don't really talk about money. Mm. But I remember like my parents would try to invest in like real estate. So they would have like one home and then they would do another apartment or something to like invest or like to put money toward that potentially rent it. Um, but there was never a conversation with us about like how we should save or invest money. But I remember in college, um, dad, my dad was telling me that like, I should use money to serve me not to become a slave of it. And in fact, I didn't know anything about stocks or any of that until my brothers reached one of my, my youngest brother reached high school and he started putting money towards stock. And I remember like coming home, you're about to lose a lot of your money. And he was in high school. He would, he would work like part-time after school and he would put his money towards that. And I thought it was just like some fraud that people <laughs> had out there. All right. And then what happened? Um, I mean, he's well off now in college. My parents didn't, he didn't take any loans. He paid his college and he bought, he bought a new brand new car for himself to commute. Yeah, he was very self-sufficient. All right, great. So um, when you graduated, how many years ago did you graduate from college? 2017, and then I went back to school again. 
for a different degree. That's awesome. All right. Fantastic. Okay. So that's great to hear. And just so I understand correctly, you both, uh, when you met, which was years, uh, more than five years ago, um, Jonathan started taking over sort of like day to day, what to do with the money. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Is that common? Is this a, is there a cultural thing here? Shalom where like, you know, where you grew up? (laughs) No, no, it's not. Okay. And my household, my mom is the one who managed the money and she's very much, um, yeah, like that. My dad is basically is in my position where um, mom takes care of everything financially or like manages everything. And he kind of said he knows, but he doesn't really. He, I don't think he has the interest or I feel like we're on the same page. I am interested to the point that I know where the money is flowing, the money flow is going, but not to the point like I, I want to know exactly what happens month to month. I know it's in a good hand and it's a a safe hand in my head. Okay. With Jonathan. Okay. Uh, What does your mom say, by the way, about your money management? Um, I used to be known in the house for spending a lot. Mm -hmm. And now? And now I think I'm better. And actually they warned Jonathan before we got married that I was very expensive. And, uh, was that like a half joke? Like, ha ha ha. She's expensive, but also like she likes to spend money. Yeah, watch out both. You know, even though they have different views on money, they're both very likable. They're open with how they feel and they're young. So even if they're not totally on the same page, they still have time to get there. Let's see if we can look at the numbers. Can you read off, you know, assets and then tell us the number that's next to it, please? 730,000. What are these assets that you have? I don't know. Okay. I think it's stocks. Um, mm, I don't think it's that. I don't know. Okay. property. I don't know. Fine. I think it's the house. Okay. You don't know. That's fine. Investments. What do you see? Um, 90,000. 90,000. All right. Savings. What do you see? Uh, 60,000. Uh-huh. And debt? 655,000. What's that total net worth that you have? Um, 225,000. All right. Have you ever seen these numbers before? Not this part. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The patterns always show up. It, don't, it, it takes me a little while, but the patterns always show up, don't they? All right. So I love putting Shalom on the spot when she's never seen these numbers in her life. Uh, what do you think about this number, 225000 as your total net worth? Is it good? Is it bad? What do you think? I mean, it's good. It's a positive number. Okay. All right, that's that's what she's got to say. All right, positive numbers are good. Two hundred twenty-five thousand. The two of you are pretty young. That seems great to me. And then, what's this generosity number? So generosity. So uh, that's kind of a, a lump fund that we like to like to keep. Uh, so you know, it could be um, generosity, just with like, let's say we know someone who's in need. Also, kind of tithing for church and that sort of thing. Basically, whatever causes are are important to us. Your savings is 16%. That's pretty aggressive. Why is your savings so high? So in general, I hear people say the rule for how much you should budget like monthly for house is like at least 1%. This really shows you that when you buy a house, not only do you have to pay those expenses up in the fixed costs, but you actually have to start putting a lot of money for future stuff. Yes. It may be future stuff that you know about, like we want to do the backyard landscaping, or it may be future stuff that hasn't broken yet, but it will break. Oh, he's looking down and he's putting his head in his hands. <laughs> What's going on? You mentioned the landscaping. So that's a whole other whole other topic. Oh, but, well, why don't yeah. we just get into it right now? Sure. You know, I so, live for this. <laughs> it was the first day after we put the offer down. Uh, I was at kind of a, a family gathering and... Um, you know, of course the house comes up as, you know, sometimes does. And, uh, we mentioned we put an offer down and I showed pictures, right? Like that's the thing you do after you say you bought a house, you, people want to see pictures. And so I go around with like Redfin on my phone, just Mm -hmm. kind of showing people pictures. And, uh, my brother-in-law who actually does, uh, you know, does a fair bit of gardening. He used to do landscaping back in the day. He looks at the, um, like the landscaping is like, 
wow, this gorgeous landscaping. Um, I hope you like landscaping. And uh, just to kind of give you some background, I'm like, I'm someone who loves books. Um, I, I don't, I don't do thing, anything really other than I'll mow the lawn. So, but when, just when it comes to kind of maintenance, that kind of thing, uh, I didn't realize it until that conversation. You like, wait, hold on. Do you like Home Depot? I absolutely hate Home Depot. My so name. like oh. I have a bit of trauma, I think just childhood trauma. My parents would spend like hours trying to find like a light fixture. Wait, me I too. Just, yeah. I really? hate this place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And there's like something like that smell of like wood chips and yeah. chemicals and wood chips and despair. So your brother-in-law mentions this to you, and then yeah. So uh, my brother-in-law mentions landscaping, and he's like, especially with shrubs. The shrubs is like you're gonna have to like hire a pro to do it. You're gonna have to really, you know, go on YouTube and watch videos. And I would have hired somebody off like Upwork immediately. Well, it's not even Upwork. I don't even know where you hire people to come to your house, but I would have been like, bring a chainsaw and bring a garbage bag. That's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, here, oh here's God. 20 bucks. Be gone in 10 minutes. I don't care yeah. how you do it. That's, no. Did you say that? <laughs> I, I actually, so what I, this is probably one of our biggest fights actually with the house. We, we've had some disagreements, but um, Shlomo was in the background and I just pulled my brother-in-law. I'm like, oh, well, I can just, I can, you know, give it a, give the, uh, the shrubbery a trim. It won't need another one. Yeah. And yeah, we'll be gone. Just done. Functional, very utilitarian. Shalom heard like chainsaw and, uh, you know, the shrubs and uh, she got, let's just say she had a reaction. Wait, so, what was your reaction? I'm asking very intently because one day this might happen to me and I need to know. Well, it was just a sounded very ignorant. He was telling your people around the party that he's going to just literally take that thing out <laughs> when he goes back. And then I'm just hearing that. She's put, like the lady who was here, she put a lot of work to it and they're not cheap shrubs. Like you call them whatever you want, but they're not cheap trees. You... <laughs> I'm listening. Keep going. This is so funny. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that's what happened. Like he wasn't even kidding. He was serious. I'm yes, going to just. He was going around saying that. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. All right. So uh, are the shrubs still there? Yes, they are. And uh, who takes care of these beautiful things? We're trying to figure that out right now. I don't want to put my generosity money for the shrubs. I, I don't know. I just love the idea of walking into their house. Jonathan and Shalom are sitting at opposite ends of the table, both of them looking at their phones, so angry with each other. And I'm like, hey guys, it's Ramit Sethi here. How's it going? And they totally set aside the years that it took for them to get to know each other, the unlikely journey it took for them to meet each other, to get married, to buy this house. And they just look up and they start cursing about these shrubs. <laughs> you know what? I have this guide I put together of questions to ask before you buy a house. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to add an extra section on expensive shrubs that can add massive relationship fights. Go ahead. You can find that link right in the show notes. I'm not kidding. Click the link. It's in the show notes. I think it kind of goes back to right, my, my principle of like putting as much money as possible um, in creating experiences, everything. And I just for me, you know, it is a small amount of money. I could probably compromise. Uh, I think for me, it's just I kind of feel I'm like already at kind of the top of what I feel comfortable spending for kind of total housing expenses. Shalom, what did you just hear? That he does not want to put more money into the house. There is a part of that. I think I've heard people often say like, you know, any money you put into the house, you get it back. And like the top percent, if you're really lucky yeah. uh, in the right market and everything, you'll get about 80% back yeah, on something. Exactly. And that's, that's like best case. And in my mind, and maybe this is kind of where I focus too much on spreadsheets, when Someone says, I have an investment for you and it'll return you 80% of the money you put in it. I don't, you know, I guess I have a hard time going with that. I, I agree. First, let's just clarify what, what Jonathan is saying, which is that, you know, a lot of people say like any money I put into the house basically turns into equity. And so if I paint or if I uh, upgrade the kitchen or whatever for $50,000 and I'm going to be able to sell the house for $50,000 more, which is largely bullshit. Because most upgrades people make in a house is purely a cost. You're not going to recover much on it. Like, just go look at some people's ghastly kitchens 
or the window treatments. It's like, I'm not going to pay for your horrible taste. I couldn't care less that you spent 30 grand on that. Too bad. There are a couple renovations in a house that tend to pay a little better. These are all easily Googleable. But all that said, we should also remember that you are living in a house with your partner. And this isn't purely a flip that you're designed to spend as little as possible and squeeze out as much ROI, right? That's different. You're actually living in this house. Because truthfully, Jonathan, if you wanted to take that approach and we took it to the logical extreme, you would have old floors, you know, like you wouldn't do any landscaping because why? You're going to make no money on it. Obviously, you live there. You got to do something, okay? The question is one of degree. How Mm -hmm. much money are you willing to put in? Shalom, what do you think hearing this? I think you had a fair point, and that's something I'm struggling with. I think communication is or clarity is a big thing, and I've been trying to communicate that. Like, yes, I'm now I'm understanding like the whole idea of like it's actually not just a house; it's an investment. But at the same time, it's a place we live in, so it has to be livable for both of us. Shalom, what happens when Jonathan gets hit by a bus one day? That's scary. Yeah, I thought about this and we talked about this. When I signed up for retirement, I got angsty because I didn't know what to choose and what to do with all these numbers. And I start losing it, saying that, like, I wish I had this educa- this much education when I was in high school or like the kind of education I- high school should be giving before we actually like become adults. Because now I'm like late 20s then i'm freaking out about like signing up for retirement or oh, yeah, what it's so late you're so late there's no chance you can catch up now 27 no, oh, you're you're that's it it's over you had a chance but you didn't I don't learn it so. so all right so yeah, uh anyway so, back to my question what happens uh if he gets hit by a bus i don't know that's a very good question and jonathan do you ever think about that yeah no, i i have thought about that and uh one of kind of one of the things that you know, I think it was really helpful. We almost never talked about money when we were first married and we've, we've come a long way, but it just seems like because the house is such a big burden that, you know, it's, it's forced us to connect on that, that deeper level. And I think we're still trying to still kind of have those kind of conversations. So, yeah. Yeah. You, you know, if you have like a bad habit in some part of life, when the stakes get higher, that habit emerges. It's like, like, I don't know, if you're bowling and you, you have a certain thing you do when you're bowling, it's fine when you're just playing with your buddies. But if you're playing at the professional level, that's going to get exposed really quickly. And in your case, for the last five years, it's been fine. Your earnings were probably really good. You know, taking a trip for an extra thousand dollars, no big deal. But getting a house is the biggest purchase you ever do. And so any lack of communication, any bad financial habits, such as one partner doing everything and the other not really participating, it gets exposed and there's a gap that becomes wider between the two of you. Mm-hmm. Does that feel like it resonates with you? Yes. Yes, for sure. Like when we had less to pay for when we first got yeah. married, again, money was not a thing we talked about. It was just, yeah. you know, he made and I made the money. We come together. We put some to our traveling, rent or whatever. And we never kind of discussed, oh, like we should probably like save this much or like it just automatically goes to things. But now because there's this big thing called house and there's a lot of things I want to do with it, I feel like we have more fights when it comes to money, more conversations that we've never had before. And um, yeah, that's totally right. Now, what do we get? What do we get to do with that money? You're going to set up your monthly meeting. You're going to talk about it. You're going to have a calm way of discussion. You go, oh, you know what? I think I think we misallocated this. Gosh, this is how I'm feeling. And when I look at this, this is what I think. What do you think? Uh, I don't know if I agree, but like, tell me more. And we talk about it. You go, oh, okay, I see your point. Let's go ahead and amend it. Done. But you can't live your life playing defense with tiny little decisions like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Ironically, mm-hmm. for the biggest financial decision of all, the two of you both admitted that you rushed right into it. So there's a pretty fascinating dynamic going on here. I'd rather have you spend more time on the big stuff and less time on the little stuff, mm-hmm. okay? The other dynamic I want to point out is that um, this is a good start with the CSP. It does feel a bit theoretical 
in the sense that um, you like Shalom, you don't talk about a CSP, you talk about a couch. So like, this is how I would approach this conversation, Jonathan. I'd be like, okay, Shalom, I understand that you want a couch. And what gets you excited about having a couch? Like, why do you want one? A place to sit, to host. Okay, but don't we have that little couch by the front door? Also, the aesthetic. Oh, so you, you want our house to look good. You don't think it looks good right now? Um, not yet. So, like, if we were able to get a couch, how much do you think a couch costs, like, ballpark? <sighs> let's, say, let's say two grand with everything. Two grand. All right, cool. Yeah. Okay, so you want a couch. It would be two grand. And, like, how soon are you thinking you want that couch? I would. I was thinking like, and maybe in the, the next three months. Uh, okay. But then that's not going to allow us, right? The budget. So yeah. I can wait. How long can you wait? I can wait a year. You can wait a year? Yeah. Okay. So okay. that would be like, what? look at Jonathan's face right now. The guy's like, I'm impressed. <laughs> Shalom's change in perspective about the couch seems small, but I think it's actually a bigger lesson that we can all apply. Most of us go through life seeing something and saying, I want that. I want that coffee. I want that night out with friends, that car, that house. But very few of us have a system to help us decide. We basically just buy whatever we see and we use very loose logic to decide if we can afford it. And then we wonder why we're not getting ahead. This way of making decisions stays with us as we become more financially successful. That's why you hear multimillionaires on this show who still agonize over the price of gas or blueberries. It's not because they don't have enough money. It's because they are arbitrarily making decisions. They have no system. With Jonathan and Shalom, you see this pattern. Jonathan analyzes purchases. Shalom is much more casual about what she wants but they haven't developed a way of making financial decisions together. The couch is really just a symptom. It's a small thing like training wheels, but together they're going to face thousands of decisions about money together. So from my perspective, this is a great opportunity to develop a shared vision, a shared system. And just note about 45 minutes ago, Shalom couldn't even believe waiting a year to get a couch. Now she seems much more open to it. Let's hear their follow-ups. Jonathan said, During the call, I was absolutely shocked that my wife said she would prefer to spend $15,000 on new wood floors than our wedding if she had to pick between the two. One of the biggest takeaways was the value in financial simplicity, which can take a lot of time and effort when there are two people involved with their own dreams and perspectives. Simplicity is not a starting point, but something that is reached through a lot of communication and compromise. Reflecting after the call, what surprised me most was how much time we spend focusing and arguing about small financial decisions like whether to buy a couch or which restaurant to visit and how little time we spend on large, important, life-changing decisions like buying a house, where to live, travel, and our long-term savings goals. I'm grateful we had the opportunity to talk with Ramit. It really helped to get another perspective on our relationship with money as well as each other. And Shalom's follow-up? Unfortunately, we never heard back from Shalom, and we tried even as recently as last week to reach her. I'm wishing Jonathan and Shalom the very best going forward. I really enjoyed speaking with both of you. And for those of you who enjoy this podcast, I'd like to encourage you to go to iwt.com slash podcast newsletter. Every single week, I share a new insight about money psychology right there on the newsletter. This is material you will never see publicly. It's iwt.com slash podcast newsletter.